Our guest in this segment is the state treasurer, Riley Moore. Riley, swinging through the panhandle. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. And you notice how ramrod straight he was sitting a second ago? Well, I was trying, but I got to kind of, <laughs> if I sit straight up, I it's can't. Not, it's not easy with the microphone. No, it? I can't, can't get this chair to go down. It doesn't. Oh, that's, oh, the, that's the issue. That's the height it will be. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what you try to do with it, that's the height. I was like, see, I'm going to have to slouch and lean forward here a little bit. So. You're permitted to slouch. All right. A slight amount of slouching is acceptable. <laughs> Sometimes Bill will, like, burrow under that desk. I've got to, I've got to like, talk to him like, hey, Bill, can you sit up a little bit straighter? Where, where'd you go? You know? Uh, what brings you into uh, the panhandle today? Well, we got a really neat event that we're doing with actually Public Square, and uh, that's going to be at 5 o'clock today at Inwood, at, and uh, you can go to publicsquare.com, uh, I believe that's a website. So this is a um, kind of a marketplace, kind of like an Amazon, that uh, is for people who have uh, conservative views, um, Christian values, things like that. So kind of just a public uh, marketplace for people of shared ideas and values like the Amazon of that. Um, Don Jr. is one of the folks that are uh, involved in that, invested in that, and a bunch of other uh, people. I would suggest if you're a business owner, uh, you have some interest, we're going to have a round table around this, and it's, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, but go to uh, Public Square. I've also put stuff out on my social media about it. And... Um, should be an interesting event you say round table i assume you'll be part of the discussion who will. else will be there Robert? well we're going to have a, a, a bunch of different businesses from the area uh they're going to be part of that we got the information out there on my website and um, it's also on public square so i put it out on social media and all that as well but it's going to be interesting um, i've never done anything with them before they had reached out uh, to the office uh, because of the work that i've done as it relates to esg and asked for just me to kind of chime in with my perspective as it relates to uh, kind of woke corporations businesses things of that nature and i said sure that sounds great can we do it in west virginia they said yes we can so very nice here we are Riley, I see the HOPE scholarship amount for the 24-25 school year is $4,921.39 to be exact. This is the, the, the Colin had it in his newscast for today. And this has been opened up as time has gone along. And are there any new requirements or regulations we need to know about for the next school year? There are. Now, this is a new addition. I can't read anything anymore. Oh, how old are you? 43. Well, it happens right about that time. So um, this is a kind of an important part that we changed here. And thank you for mentioning the amount. And people might say, well, that's more than it was in the last um, school year. And that is correct. So uh, the per pupil student funding formula went up. As you remember, there's a teacher pay raise, right? So as teacher pay raises come in, Hope Scholarship goes up because the per pupil student funding formula goes mm -hmm. up. So the one thing that is of note, we now have an open application period for the 24-25 school year. So that starts, and it's already begun now, March 1st. So from March 1st to June 15th, if you apply, and it's open all year now, we don't have the cutoff as we did previously. From March 1st to June 15th, if you apply, you will be awarded the full amount of the HOPE scholarship from June 16th to September 15th. If you apply, you get 75% of it. September 16th to November 30th, you get 50%. And then from December 1st to February 28th, you get 25%. Now, after February 28th is March 1st, and then we've started back over again, obviously, right? So if you're past February 28th, of 2025 then you're not going to be awarded any uh hope scholarship dollars for that fit uh, for that school year because the school year is literally almost over mm -hmm. so how many, how many students are receiving money from hope scholarship uh currently right now we have about uh six thousand three hundred applicants um that we that we've received during the during the uh the last full uh school year that we did so we settled in around 6,000. Some people don't finish them or this or that or whatever reason to decide to take it. It's about 6,000 students that we have. 
now refresh me, Hope Scholarships, who, who is eligible for Hope Scholarship? Yes, so that is a good question. So anybody who is currently in public school is eligible for Hope Scholarship. And so that's kind of the trick here, I guess. Not a trick, but it's one of the things to keep in mind, the way the law was written. Um, I was not supportive of this, but this was the the way it got passed is that you have this 45-day requirement. So you must be in public school 45 consecutive days to be eligible for Hope Scholarship. But if you're a rising kindergartner and you've never been to school, you can go get your Weavis number from your local school board and go right into uh, Hope Scholarship, which can be used for private school or home school or any other type of uh, alternative educational path. Obviously, charter school is public, so you don't need Hope Scholarship dollars to do that. But uh, that's the group that we see the greatest increase is kindergartners. So, excuse me, uh, Riley, so if somebody, uh, a homeschooling, uh, they have to attend 45 days in a public school, then leave the public school to go to homeschool before they're eligible for Hope Scholarship? If they are currently in homeschool or private school, they do have to have 45 days, consecutive days of instruction in a pr uh, public school be to be eligible. That seems kind of odd to me. I it is kind of odd, um, and it's certainly made the job of administering this program difficult. Um, but you can dual enroll. There are folks who are dual enrolled, say, like on an online charter school. Uh, that is permissible under the rules of this program. So you could be dual enro enrolled in like an online public charter school. But that is the way they passed it. It was explained to me uh, by the legislature that the issue was they were worried about the fiscal note hitting all at once. So now when we get to the 26, 27 school year, it opens up to everybody. So if you're in private school, home school, you don't need to do this 45 day consecutive thing anymore. It just opens, you are eligible. I want to ask you, in regards to the federal government and the clawback provisions of some of the COVID money, uh, Riley, and it amounts to a pretty significant amount. That's going to be dominating the legislature as they try to figure out a budget and get it passed. And that budget affects what you do as the treasurer, uh, maybe what funds are available for the Hope Scholarship. How close are you watching those discussions right now? Yeah, I'm pretty acutely aware of them. And I, I think what you're going to see happen here is that there are, and the governor's office has been talking about this, that some required documents that need to be submitted as it relates to the amount of spending around education, which they needed to uh, hit a certain benchmark. And I don't think that's been communicated to the feds. So you're going to see a, what I would call like a skinny budget passed here in the next you know, several days at the end of legislative session. And then they're going to come back in May to address uh, the rest of the budget um, as it relates to this clawback, which I think they'll be able to work out. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. The governor said there is not a clawback. Uh, and he said there definitely is not a clawback provision. Not a clawback provision with the feds? Yeah, he said what the fed was saying, uh, that uh, the that. The, his interpretation, it's not a clawback. It could be a redirection of funds, but it's not going to be money that the uh, state will have to give back to the feds. Well, I guess we'll see on that. Um, but there appears to be I, some disagreement on that. But, yeah. I, but I will tell you that COVID money was caveated with the ability for the feds to claw it back. Mm. Uh, that That's a federal law. What didn't we do? Well... <laughs> You know, I'd have to, you know, be in the governor's administration to be able to tell you that. Um, I, I think that we had spent on, this is just my outside view, and uh, what it appears to be that they had to demonstrate a certain level of spending on education to be able to retain that $450 million from the feds. And I think through teacher pay raises, school building authority, and things like that, they'll. It sounds like they'll be able to demonstrate that, um, but don't take my word for that. That's just what I have heard from them. I don't know that as a fact because I'm not in the inner circle, uh, so to speak. I'm just the guy who's 
taking a look out there. Am I getting an ACH request from U.S. Treasury? <laughs> but I, I, some of the claims I, uh, the, at least the governor's taken defense that it, the money was used for very important infrastructure items and not specifically for education. And uh, taking it one step farther, my understanding is now the governor is going to go back and do just what Riley said, uh, going to identify certain things that were done and make a stronger tie to education than what it was before. Yeah, uh, their contention in this is that they weren't including, like, teacher pay raises. Teacher pay raises a lot of money. I mean, it's well over $100 million. Um, school building authority, we're building schools, things like that. It's a lot of money involved in that. So I think that um, it is certainly, I'd say, likely, it seems like from what they're saying, that they'll be able to uh, demonstrate the level of spending that was required. Yeah. Mr. Gilstrap. I got to ask it. Is there any thought, any chance? Is there any feeling that this is a political decision on the part of the federal government to? You know, I, I you know, my mind always goes there, but <laughs> so, so does Gilstrap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, mine I, doesn't. <laughs> in, in 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 this regard, I don't think so. Um, the problem was there was so this money was moving so quickly out of U.S. Treasury and to the states during COVID, that they were passing the rules later on restrictions and how it can be spent and how, you know, how it's reported and all that other stuff. So it's almost the cart was before the horse type of thing. And so people went out and started spending money and then here's the rules. And you tried to, uh, obviously everybody tried to stay within those guidelines. I, I'd say it's uh, not been administered well at all. Uh, it's been administered uh Terribly, I'd say, by U.S. Treasury and the Fed. But uh, I, I think that's how we got kind of crossways in this whole thing. I don't think it's political, but um, if somebody told me it was, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, yeah. if you remember when that money was distributed, the Justice Administration came under a lot of criticism for holding on to it for such a long time while other states were distributing it. And the governor's response was, we don't know what we're allowed to use it for yet. And it seems like West Virginia was extra cautious in using the money initially. So if, if there are inconsistencies, you would think that they would be explainable considering how much extra caution was used in distributing those funds. I don't know if you remember that or not, Bill, but there was a lot of there, problems. There was. Also, there's so much complexity about how the money was distributed. It was not just one block of money. It was a block here, and uh, six months, another different block. Build a baseball and, stadium. Yeah, that's right. And they all, uh, some of them had a, a very defined targets or uh, requirements, others less so. But I think in this particular case, it's all a, uh, it's a product of misinterpretation. Uh, unlike <laughs> some of the uh, school districts in the southern part of the state, there's no fraud involved. There's no misuse of money. It's just a misinterpretation of how the money should be used. Riley, anything else we need to know about the Hope Scholarship for the 24-25 school year? No, I think that's it. But in terms of the funding, the way that, you know, because I could, anytime we're wired money, I get it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, here's the email. Um, they sent it to us in massive blocks, only two. So we get over $600 million. I'd open up my email. You got a $600 million deposit today. And then we'd get the next $600 million deposit. And then it's inside those pots of money, you know, those huge blocks of money, they're supposed to all be spent in certain specific ways for certain things and only certain amounts can be spent in this direction and that direction. So, it, it, yeah, it was rather confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably why Justice Administration sat on it so long. Helpful for us because we were learn earning a lot of good interest off of it, which also helps the state as well. Sure. Can, let me shift this to the political realm very quickly. Uh, Mike Stewart is jumping on this and saying it was all that uh, uh, J.B. Mikulski was partly at fault not doing his job. Uh, is there any validity to that claim? Uh, not, not that I'm aware okay. of. You know, I mean, it, oh, and this is one of the things we actually had to call the U.S. Treasury and the feds. And it's like, OK, so I'm earning interest on this money. You, they didn't even put in the rules what you do with earned interest. So it's like, what do we, can we get a rule on this? And U.S. Treasury put a rule out that earned interest we're allowed to keep uh, as part of our general revenue. But uh, I talked to them, they're like, yeah, we hadn't thought about that. Nice. <laughs> it's like, 
It's a lot of money. I'd probably think about it. Yeah. <laughs> $600 million tends to rack up a couple of points. Yeah, well, it's, you know, $600 million here and then the next $600 million. Now we're, you know, over $1.2 billion. You're in Stubblefield territory. Right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> talking Admiral money. Yeah, yeah talking Admiral money. Yeah. Or, 1099 on that interest. Or, pay or, you yeah. or New York Times bestseller. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ryan, let's talk about your uh, race for Congress. Uh, there are a few folks who are involved in this, but. Uh, I understand the latest polling numbers still have you comfortably ahead. Yeah, you know, um, I wouldn't say I'm comfortable. I'm never comfortable in these elections till they're over. Sure. Um, you know, it's uh, you're either unopposed, running unopposed or scared, right? So mm -hmm. we're out there. I'm working hard. Um, you know, I'm obviously doing my job in Charleston. And as I go back and forth in between Charleston and the Eastern Panhandle, I'm making many, many uh, campaign stops. And we've been all over the district. I've been to every county in the district multiple times, and I will continue to do that. But everywhere I go, uh, I've had a tremendous amount of support, particularly because, and as I say out here, I have a proven record. I am the proven conservative choice here. I'm a proven conservative. Anybody can come out here and say, well, I'm pro-life. Okay, well, what have you done for the pro-life movement? Well, I have a record on that issue that I can point to. It's why West Virginians for Life came out so early and endorsed me. It's why Susan B. Anthony List has endorsed me. I have a proven record on these issues. And people say, well, how are you going to vote? Well, take a look at my voting record in the state legislature. I had one of the most conservative voting records in the state legislature. That is exactly how I'm going to vote if I get to Congress. So I, I think I'm, you know, solidly ahead we keep seeing that in the polls i'm sure there'll be no, some other public poll come out here soon that would i would guess reflect the same thing uh, our internals look like that but we take nothing for granted and um, you know anybody can surge in these things late you know we're just over two months out from election day and so we're going to keep uh, keep my foot on the gas but uh, look you know take a look at my record if you are happy with that record you will be happy with the way that I serve in Congress. 60 Minutes did a feature last night on the governor of Texas and his actions down by the southern border and what he's trying to do in defiance of the federal government and securing that border. And I know sometimes uh, you think that a news organization can take a slant on something one way or the other. Uh, I actually thought they did a fairly good job of portraying the helpless situation the governor is in uh, last night. Did you see the feature, Bill? I did see it, yes. Uh, if you are elected to Congress, at some point along the way, I would hope, Congress takes up the southern border and the greater question of immigration reform, which really needs addressed, uh, Riley. What are your thoughts on that? And if put to a vote, what would be the best thing to do with the southern border uh, next year if you're in office? Yeah, you know, I and I feel terrible for what's going on down there for these folks in Texas. And I think the governor of Texas is doing the best he can to protect his citizens, which he has been elected to do, and ensure their security. He does have a duty to do that. Uh, in terms of the border, you know, we always try to put these two things together, border security and immigration reform. I, I don't necessarily agree with those two things being uh, tied together, I think we need to first control the border. We got to get this border under control. This is not, we're in a situation now where we're not even talking about just people coming from Latin America uh, e over the southern border. We have people from Syria, we have people from Yemen, we have people from the Middle East. We've had, we've stopped a hundred, stopped, so who knows who else has come in, 125 people who are on terrorist watch list. This is a security threat to this country, 100%. That, that is an, a non-negotiable or arguable question. So we must secure the border. No more illegal immigration into this country. It must stop now. And we deal with that first. Once we have taken care of that, then we deal with immigration reform. We did this in the inverse during the Reagan administration. You had amnesty and some immigration reform, and then the border was never secured. We have to do that in the opposite way this time. But, Riley, if, if assuming you're elected, you'll be 100, you'll one 435th 
of the House of Representatives. So as a practical matter, what can you do along those lines? Well, I think it's like with any legislative body, you could say the same thing. Well, Riley, you're one of 100 in the state legislature. What are you going to do? Well, I ended up getting a lot done. I'm not suggesting um, that you would get anything done. I'm, yeah. I'm asking what is the plan? What would your solution be or what, what what's the flag you would carry to get this done? And you have one minute to answer that, by the way. Yeah. So I think what you do is get with like-minded people and – form a coalition around the idea of border security first, border security first. We're doing border security first. We're not doing that tied to immigration reform. Border security must happen first. It's a very simple talking point. It seems like something everybody should be able to get their minds around and just beating that drum. And there are people that agree with that in in Congress. We just need more people to wrap their minds around why that is the most important thing. So it's just working with different people who would be in the United States Congress, working on the earned media uh, strategy around that as well, and trying to get that out there and make sure people know why it's so important. Bill, you got 15 seconds yeah. to make your point. Uh, so I gather that you feel the Langford Compromise Bill was not an opportunity lost. 10 that, seconds, Riley. That was a terrible bill, and I'm glad it never passed. That was like three. You came in seven seconds under the desk. Yeah. <laughs> he knows his talking points, Bill. He knows an easy setup. <laughs>